Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. This is God's word. James uses the word sin in verse 17. Which sin is he describing? Well, as you're reading this passage and you're looking at this word sin, it seems a little out of place. It seems a little odd that he would put the, the Greek word hamartia, sin, in this passage. Because as you're reading it, you're thinking this is about our plans and short life expands. I mean, that's kind of what we see from this passage. You see how people are making plans and then there's a short life expectancy for all of us. So where does this sin thing fit in? Because it seems a little strange and out of place. I mean, do we really need another sermon about the brevity of life and God's providence? And that's what it looks like from this passage. Well, James is doing nothing more than reiterating what he's already said in James chapter 4, verse 10. And if you have your Bibles, you can look at it with me. He says, humble yourselves before the Lord. Humble yourselves. Fall into rank. Submit yourself to God. Acknowledge God as sovereign over your life. And allow God to be God. Now, allow us to let the Holy Spirit, and he is God the Holy Spirit, allow us to let him teach us today about sin and the solution from this passage. I want you to see two things from this passage, and it comes straight from the passage, as always. I figure if I stick with the text, I can't get myself in trouble. First point is you do not know. Straight from the text. Number one, you do not know. Point number two, if the Lord wills. There's your outline for our text. I want you to know where we're going. Point number one, you do not know. Go back, look at the text. Look at verses 13 and 14. He says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What's your life? You are a mist that appears a little time and then vanishes. Which sin is James describing to these dispersed Christians? Well, he says, you don't know. You have no idea. You don't know what's to come. He's helping to realize the shortness of their knowledge, their abilities. You do not know. Now, look at verse 13 with me. As he starts this passage, he says, come now, you who say. Stop there. This seems a little cryptic to us, kind of codified, but to the first century reader, this is not cryptic. This is straight in their face. This is actually what's called an indictment. From the first century, this is what an indictment looks like. What's an indictment? It's a formal written process to say there's something from an authoritative body that's coming to you. What's coming to us? Well, God the Holy Spirit carries James along as he pens this text, and he says, come now, you who say... There's authority behind this very phrase, and it's used in its historical setting, and it's good if we recognize that, yes, and it's an indictment. For one to sit up, pay attention, don't fall asleep, don't get distracted, you need to hear this. It's kind of in your face. But we've already realized that's who James is. He's a man who speaks straight to your face. He doesn't cut corners, he doesn't massage, he doesn't try to manipulate, he's going to tell you like it is. And straight from this text, he says, listen up, there's an indictment that needs to come against you. What's their action? What's the indictment about? Well, go back to the text, and he says, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. What are they doing? They're making plans. Now, is it a sin to make plans? No, we should all make plans. Jesus says in Luke chapter 14, verse 28, for which of you... Desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. So is it a sin to, to plan things out? Of course not. Even Jesus tells us that it's not. So what's the sin? Well, you're going to see here in just a second, the sin is control. 
they're trying to control everything. They like to plan, but they want to plan it out to a T so they can control every little nook and cranny. Yes, that's a West Cobb term. But they want to make schedules. On paper, they want to control when. It says today or tomorrow. That's when. On paper, they want to control where. We're going to go into such and such a town. On paper, they want to control how long. We're going to spend a year there, 365 days. On paper, they're telling you what they're going to do. They're going to trade and make a profit. You see what's lurking behind this passage? These people are motivated, they're organized, they're self-willed, they're self-dependent. Uh, they have to have a little bit of cash and wealth because they're going to make a profit and you've got, you got to have some money in order to make some money. But it's all about control. You know that control is the dopamine of life. Medical doctors will tell you that when we sense the feeling of control, it releases chemicals in our brains similar to those that when we drink too much, have sex, take drugs, all of those chemicals are released in the brain. And here, James knows what he's doing. Even though he wasn't a medical doctor by trade, he knows we all have a control problem. We try to control every little thing. And here he's saying, hey, control freaks should put things on their calendar in pencil, not pen. Why? Well, bury your nose back in the text. Look at verse 14. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. You see the contrast? These self-reliant people, people that love to make plans, that love spreadsheets, well, they don't even know what tomorrow will bring. Oh, they've planned out 365 days. It's all meticulous in detail. And he says, yeah, you don't even know what tomorrow will bring. The word here, no, epistemia in the Greek, is from when we get our word epistemology. Epistemology, the study of how we know things. He says, you don't even know how to know things. You're so confused. But you plan and you plan, and you put it on your calendar. And, and let me just give you a little pastoral advice. Don't trust your calendar, trust your creator. You don't know. I don't know. We're silly little control freaks thinking we can control every facet of life. And God, in his word, tells you, no. No plan, but you can't control. Write it in pencil. Solomon says in Proverbs 27, 1, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. This is man's limited control. Proverbs 16.1 says, the plans of the heart belong to man. Go ahead, make plans. But before you plan, pray and pray and pray and continue to pray and then make the plans and then pray some more. You know, my wife and I do this every month when we do our budget before the month begins. We see what we've got coming in. We see all the money that's going out for expenses. And we pray. Lord, help us as we walk through this budget, as we implement this throughout the month. Make plans, but before you ever make one plan, pray and pray and pray. Now, what's the sin here? The sin is they're trying to harness some of God's incommunicable attributes. Might be a big term for some of you. Incommunicable and communicable. Incommunicable, those things that only God has. Communicable, those things he shares. Goodness, love. Those are things that we share that we can have. Incommunicable are those things that we cannot, that are only designated to God. And the sin here from these people, as he puts these words in their mouths, is they're trying to harness the incommunicable attribute of a seity. A-S-E-I-T-Y. A seity. Now, some of you say, why are we getting thick in the weeds in theology? You're not going to get it anywhere else if you don't get it from your pastor. And I'm trying to bring all of us up so that we know more about God that we're not living at a sophomoric elementary level in our Christian faith. We do need to grow. We need to know more about God. 
You're not getting that from the culture. You're not getting that from the news. You need to get it from your church. So we need to grow. So they're trying to actually grab the aseity part. What is aseity? It's God's self-existence. God was not created. God does not need clothes. He does not need food. He is not contingent or dependent upon anyone else. This is the wonderful attribute of God. And that's what silly little Americans try to do, aren't we? We're trying to have the aseity of God. We're trying to be self-reliant, independent, not dependent upon anyone else so they don't have to help us out. And that's what these sinful, persecuted Christians are doing. They want to have autonomy. I want to be all by myself. I don't want to have to rely on anyone else. What else are they doing? What other kind of sin are they committing? Well, they're trying to, to grab for the incommunicable attribute of omniscience. They want to know all things. They want to be able to understand how everything kind of functions together and they can lay it out on their spreadsheets and lay it on their calendars and they can implement and everything goes to a T. And the Bible tells us that only God alone has omniscience. Only he knows all things and we are limited creatures. We were never created to be self-reliant. By definition, the word creation means there's a creator that we have to depend upon. The Bible actually tells us that this morning you got up solely on the basis because God allowed you to get up. He gave you life and breath. He sustained you through the night as you slept. We're about to start a new year. 365 days. He'll sustain you or he will either remove you. He gives you life and breath, or he takes it away at his own designated time. What's the sin? These people are trying to know all things. They're trying to grab that incommunicable attribute of omniscience. And since we are not omniscient, we worry. Anybody worried lately? Yeah. It's because we have an infinitesimal amount of knowledge. It's so small. I mean, if we combined all the knowledge of all human history... It would only fill up the bottom part of God's thimble. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And we are restless because we want that incommunicable attribute of omniscience. We want to know all things. We want to know how it all plays out, and we're finite creatures. We have start date, finish date. That's what the Bible tells us. Some of you can lay down at night, but you can't sleep. You're still grasping for that omniscience. You want to know all things, and God says no. James, however, reaches the apex of his argument. If you go back, look at the text. He says, what is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. The Bible tells us in the book of Job and Psalms that we are but a few hand breaths. Wow. Very short. God actually tells us from Genesis 3 verse 19, For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 103, As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it and it's gone, and its place knows it no more. The Apostle Paul says that you're here today and you're gone tomorrow. It's a sobering reality for all of us, isn't it? James says, what's your life? What is your life? What do you think is your life? I mean, that's that huge philosophical question, right? No, this is a biblical question asked by God the Holy Spirit through the Apostle James to Christians. What is your life? He answers and says, you're a mist that appears for a little time. We have no control over our birth, and you all know this. You didn't control the date on which day you were born. If it were up to me, I would have never been born in January. I hate the month of January. It's cold. I get depressed in January. I can't stand it. It's like this. Gray. It's awful. I want to be born in June or July at the beach. I love the sun. I love the warm weather. But I couldn't control it. Neither can you. 
can't control when you are created. Oh, and by the way, you can't control when you die either. It's out of our hands. And that's why James says here, you do not know. So what's the solution? Well, let's go back to the text. This is point number two, if the Lord wills. Look at verses 15 through 17. He says, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him, it is sin. What's the solution to the fact that we don't know? If the Lord wills. If he wills, then I will. You pray, you make plans, and you say, if the Lord wills, then I will. We're going to carry this out. We're going to do it. I'll be doing this if the Lord wills. Now, he uses the word say here. Go back and look at the text. He says, instead, you ought to say. Lego is the word. It's a present active infinitive. What does that mean? It means you could, should continue saying, if the Lord wills. You don't say it one time. You continue saying it throughout your life. And this is not some kind of superstition so that you just start a sentence or finish a sentence with if the Lord wills and you think that brings, you, brings God underneath your debt now. Because now you've used this little phrase from the Bible. Oh, well, he has to carry out my plan because I said if the Lord wills. No, you pagan. That's not it. That's like the whole idea of luck. I'll keep beating this drum until I die, by the way. Luck is... Pagan, stop using the word. It's providential blessings. Hey, I hope you go win your baseball game. Good luck. God already has it determined. He knows. You go get after it. You pray during the game and let the pieces fall. And whatever it is, good or bad, you win or lose, it's in God's providence. It's in his hands, and he's using it. Don't you know that that's what Joseph felt like? I mean, one after another after another, bad things are happening to Joseph. He's got to be like, come on, God, seriously? You probably would have never heard those words on J Joseph's lips. Oh, this is just bad luck. No. No, he kept marching on. And one day he, he realizes, wow, this is God's providential hand leading me and guiding me. What a blessing. So, if the Lord wills, we will live. Did you notice that? Go back and look at the text. If the Lord wills wills we will live man the lord willed for you to be living today isn't that great he said i'm going to give you a day to live i'm going to give you a day to experience my grace my goodness my glory a time to come together with other believers to worship him i'm going to give you another day to experience all these common grace that, that i give to you because i love you i care for you i sustain you i supply everything that you need if the lord wills we will live and do this or that now pray plan put it in your calendar but you better put it on paper with pencil because it says here if 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 it's contingent if the lord wills Proverbs tells us, Proverbs 16, 3, that we are to commit our work to the Lord and that our plans will be established. Commit it all to him. Every single thing that you're doing, doesn't matter what it is, it can't be too small or too big. Commit everything. When you wake up in the morning, commit to him your work to, to love your spouse, the one that he's given you, to the best of your ability by his spirit and by his grace, loving your kids, your grandkids, your great grandkids, going to that job and working as hard as you can, no matter if you love the job or you hate it, he's got you there for a reason. I think we've all been there. We've had to work a job. You're like, seriously, Lord, can I please find another job? He's got you there for a reason and a season. It's not forever, but he's got you there for something. Will you put up your antenna to look and see how you might be able to be used by the master's hand as he leads you and guides you because he has a master plan. So commit your work to him. But notice what these people do. Go back to the text. He says, as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. 
in a word, this is pride. Pride consumes us. We think that we are the solution to all of life's problems. If I can just do this, I will fix that. If I can just do this, I will fix that. But do you know how you always say if I can do this or that? It's not you. It's if the Lord wills. You know, we are a bunch of little control freaks. We are kind of like little sham guards. You remember sham guard? He's my favorite from Judges. When I was examined on the presbytery floor, I'll never forget I said Shamgar, and like five of the guys were like, did he say Shamgar? Is that in the Bible? Yeah, Judges chapter 3, my favorite guy, Shamgar. You remember it. Judges chapter 3, verse 31, it says that Shamgar killed 600 of the Philistines with an ox goat, and he saved Israel. Oh, that's just great. Love that. If you're a man in here, your blood should be pumping right now. Oh, he killed 600 Philistines. The bad guys. He's a farmer with an ox goad, just a pointy object. Can you imagine? He's like greater than John Wick. I mean, this guy's amazing. He's just killing them all. Fires me up. I love to hear this. And I want to be a shamgar, but I'm totally inept. I'm a little control freak who thinks I can do this. I can be shamgar. No, no, you can't be shamgar. You're far from it, buddy. You have trouble working with tools. So, do you know that in this life, that a life of, of self-reliance, self-dependent, it's suffocating. It really is suffocating. It'll drive you crazy. And the life of flourishing is saying, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. We're going to plan some things. We're going to try some things. You guys want to laugh at God for a second? Because sometimes he wants us to laugh. I know, most of us are Presbyterians. Uh, we don't like to laugh. I get it. But for just a second, think about God's humor. A year, two years ago, you, you never thought you were going to be sitting on the campus of a Methodist church. And it just so happens that God predestined that we would be meeting on an Arminian campus. That's funny. He works in mysterious ways. And if he'll do that kind of work amongst us, what could he do in the future? See, we pray small prayers. We plan small things. And usually it's because we don't say if the Lord wills. The Lord's got some great plans. He's got great things ahead for his adopted children through Christ Jesus. Wonderful things. Yes, we have an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for us. Yes, we have that to go towards. And if we have that now, that should free us. Free us to live lives that are completely radically different than the culture around us. Lives that want to bring him glory and honor and praise. Lives that want to reach many with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Looking for every opportunity. Some of you can speak the good news. You can share the good news. You're good at presenting these things. Some of you are prayer warriors. Get in your closet and pray like crazy because your prayers matter. Some of you just need to live lives of integrity at work. And people will see the work of Christ through you. But each one of you are equipped and ready to go about this work that God has for you. He has set in motion. He has ordained your days. He's ordained our days together as people. He knew when we would start and if we'll ever finish. He knows when we will live and when we will die. God is completely in control. And if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. I am under no illusion that I think I am the one who has all the answers in this assembly. As many of you know, I went to public school don't have all the answers. And that's why I've been meeting with all of you to get your counsel and your wisdom. Because collectively, we can ask the Lord to lead us instead of having one authoritarian trying to do all of the heavy lifting and then telling you that you just need to fall in rank. No, the only rank we need to fall into is underneath God. If the Lord wills. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Stop. You tune me out because you've heard it a million times. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Not some, not three quarters, but all. All of your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he'll make straight your paths. If you're forcing something, 
and you keep forcing it and you keep forcing it, maybe God's not actually going to do anything until you stop forcing it. Just a suggestion. I've seen it play out in many people's lives where they thought they had the reins, that they were going to keep forcing an issue, and the moment that they finally resigned from being a control freak and gave it to the Lord, incredible things happened. And some of us, we do want to force things. The best thing we can do is humble ourselves before the Lord. Now, some of us in here are control freaks. I know there's, there's a few of us in here. How do I know that? Well, we're not the first control freaks. Uh, if you go back to the Bible, you'll remember a guy by the name of Abraham. Was he a control freak? Yeah, he lied about his wife so that the Egyptians wouldn't kill him. He says, this is my sister, not my wife. He lied on most, multiple accounts, and he was a control freak. He was trying to control things instead of just telling the truth and leaving it in the hands of the Lord. What about Moses? Was he a control freak? Yeah. God said, you're going to go be my spokesman before Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the universe. What did Moses say? He said, I have a speech impediment. I can't do it. I'm trying to make excuses, God. I can't go do this. Control freak. How about David? Oh, David, man, David loved politics, and David loved to manipulate people. And David used all kinds of political moves so that he could hurt people and get his way. Need I go on? I better not, or I'll get myself in trouble. We're not in control. That's what James is telling us here. And the minute that we stop committing idolatry, and that is thinking that we are God, giving it to the Lord, yes, making the plans because there's the sovereignty of God and the will of man, but in the end, whose will's bigger? Many of us know. The question is very pointed. Because many of us have tried things in the past, and we've tried, and we've tried, and we've tried, and it never came to fruition. Why? Because God said no. It's God. God tells you no. Sometimes we won't listen to that, will we? It's not God. That's Satan. Satan's telling me no. No? No? <laughs> Satan is God's Satan. He's underneath God's thumb. So it's God who sometimes tells us no. And he moves us on. Proverbs 19.21 says, Many are the plans in the mind of man, but is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Whew. It's his purpose. It's always going to stand, no matter what. Have you been committing this sin? Oh, I have done this. Time and time again, I have not said, if the Lord wills. I've said, if Mick wills. If Mick wills, this is what will happen, and this is what will happen. And we sin, and we fall short of God's standards. So what are we to do? Well, Psalm 55, 22 says, cast your burden on the Lord, and he will sustain you. You can't fix it. I can't fix it. The Lord can fix it. And the Lord will work through people in your life to help you, to sustain you, because individually, we do not know. But by God's grace and his help and his love and his wisdom, through his people, we can know. We can know him. We can know his power. We can know his wisdom. And we can love and care for one another. This scripture is very clear. You do not know if the Lord wills. Humble yourselves before the Lord. The Lord alone has a seity. The Lord alone has omniscience. The Lord alone needs those instead of us because he is God. And we are not. And that's comforting for us. It should also be all inspiring and it should be, well, a certain sense of fear when we know that God alone has self-existence because, again, we are made from dust. And to dust, we shall return. That's why we sing that hymn, I need thee every hour. It's true. We need thee every hour. 
The wonderful message of the gospel is that Jesus was forsaken so that we'll never be forsaken. Whatever trial, tribulation, remember when James started this letter, he said, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. The Bible tells us, Isaiah 49, 16, behold, I've engraved you on the palms of my hands. He will never forget us, even though there are times where we forget him. And we can go back to him and confess this sin for trying to be silly little control freaks. And that's what's so wonderful about the Lord's Supper. Is it allows us to come back and confess our sins of being control freaks. But also going back and humbling ourselves underneath his mighty hand. What he's done for us on the cross. Through his death, his burial, his resurrection. And he says, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. Let's pray.